Welcome to another class on Christology. And we this is the thirty second class and we will have four more classes to go. I trust that you have gleaned a lot from the class or the classes and your understanding of the Bible is cleared up. I'm trusting for that. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace and mercy and truth. Lord, the mercies in you every morning. Morning by morning, your mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness. Bless this class, I pray, Lord Jesus. Bless the participants in the class. Bless me as I share with these participants. Bless the system. Lord, I've lost one video since today. And I know it is the enemy. It is the third in a row. But each time I sit to, to a video, a class, something goes wrong for me to lose one. I put them out in your hands and I, re I rest, bind and crush all foes of darkness, seeking to wear me out, seeking to block the progress of this class. I rest them, Lord, bind them and crush them in the mighty name I pray. Amen. So we are continuing, we're still under Olivet. This course, remember that it, is, it was given two or three days before the crucifixion. Two or three days before the crucifixion. And we are still on it. Remember that there are three major discourses recorded in the Bible. The, um, some say the sermons on the mountain or the Beatitudes and then the Olivet Discourse and then the Upper Room Discourse. The Upper Room Discourse is for the church. And John has given a lot of it. He has gone to great lengths to give the Upper Room Discourse. So we are looking now at the Olivet Discourse. And both discourses, the Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse, are for the Jews. We can get principles and lessons from them, but they're primarily for the Jews, not for the church. All right, make the distinction. No, the reason assigned by Christ for the admission of these sheep nations, sheep nations, you know, not just Jews, but sheep nations, or the Gentile nations, um, into the kingdom is altogether explicit. In them has been wrought out one thing which secures the divine approval and blessing. It is not a matter of bestowing divine grace, but rather of commending pure merit. Commending pure merit. merit. They have provided food, drink, shelter, clothing, and comfort for the king. Merit mean, meaning that they work for it. They work for it. And it says they provided them for the king, but it was for the king's people, the Jews. The remarkable feature of this is that they themselves do not identify any such service as having been wrought by them. And the first word to break their awful silence is when, in like manner, those on the left hand are di dismissed into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And this is the lake of fire. There won't be another judgment for them. But the lake of fire is the final judgment. Fire, 
place of torment because the hell itself will be thrown in the lake of fire comes the white throne judgment the lake of, they will be thrown in the lake of fire <coughs> And for the announced reason that they have not provided food, drink, shelter, clothing, and comfort for the king or the king's people, they in turn are equally unconscious of this omission on their part, and, and they to break their silence by in, inquiry, inquiry when. All of this creates a challenge to the thoughtful student. Is there an issue in the world? so vast in its import that it determines the destiny of nations and yet it is wholly unrealized and unrecognized by those nations who will stand before the king is that so such a problem is set up in this context by the king himself and will not be overlooked by candid minds. It makes no difference at this point what method of interpretation is employed. The problem, as thus stated, is up for solution by every school of interpretation. Those who assume that this scene is the judgment of the saved and unsaved at the end of the world find it most difficult to identify a third group whom the, f the king styles my brethren. If the sheep nations are the saved people of all generations, who are these brethren? If the brethren are the saved ones who constitute the church, who are the sheep nations? How could the church ever be thus thrown back upon an unmitigated merit basis of acceptance with God? when they have already been accepted in the beloved? How could the church be entering the kingdom as subjects of the king when she is sitting with him on his throne and reigning with him? So it's not the church. They're already seated with the king. Similarly, the church has never been cast upon the bounty of the cosmos for her physical sustenance and comfort. To her, it has been promised and fulfilled that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 Any interpretation that would bring the church into this scene either as the brethren or as the sheep nations is impossible from any consideration. The king's own reply to the query when is the answer that should satisfy the student of the, con of the text as it will satisfy the nation that stand before him. Whatever these multitudes are able to understand can be understood by the average person of today if he will approach the subject with unprejudiced consideration of all that is involved. The king will say, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, Jesus was a Jew when he walked this earth. So the Jews would be his brethren. Who then are these who are classed as my brethren? Upon a covenant theology which recognizes but two classes of men in future estate, the saved and the lost, and but two places, heaven and hell, there has been an insuperable problem imposing in accounting for the third group who are identified by the king as my brethren. It is assumed by these theologians that the saved of all ages are on the right hand and the lost are on the left hand. Beyond these, according to their teaching, there could be no others. Yet the king indicates a, a third class. There are two groups who may be identified as Christ's brethren. Christians are joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8.17 And they are the many brethren to whom he 
is revealed as the firstborn. Romans 8.29 However, as already indicated, Christians answer to none of the features set forth in this description. The Christians have been saved at death to life, passed on death to life, and coming back with Christ in the air. So it's not Christian, it's not the church. On the other hand, Israel in her age did, did stand and must yet stand upon a merit basis. And in this age, she is cast upon the bounty of the cosmos world. Those who in the coming tribulation will have suffered, for Christ's sake, Matthew 24, 9, are his brethren after the flesh, according to the flesh. Uh -huh. The kingdom which is in view belongs to Israel, and it is fitting to observe that since certain Gentile, pe Gentile peoples are to inherit a place in Israel's kingdom, they should be such as have, by a previous demonstration, exercised a sympathy for Israel, the elect nation before God. There is no mere accident in the fact that the two words blessed and cursed appear in the Abrahamic covenant respecting the attitude of Gentiles toward Abraham's seed according to the flesh. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, I bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And these words appear again when Gentiles are being brought into the judgment respecting their treatment of, his, of God's elect people. In Genesis it is written, I will bless them that bless you, you. And in the description of the judgment of the nations, it is said, Come, you blessed of my father. In Genesis it is said, I will curse them who curse at you. While in this same judgment it is said, Depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire. But why? Only because you did it, or you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren? Existing without attention to the word of God, the nations have never realized the favored place Israel holds in the love and purpose of God. Nor do they accept this truth when it is presented to them. To no other people has Jehovah said, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen you to be a special people unto him, himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bond men from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It is to these same people that he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 3. They are kept by him as the apple of his eye and are graven upon the palms of his hands, respecting the immutable character of, God, of Jehovah's devotion to Israel. It is written, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11:29. All this is true whether conceded by the nations or not. Warnings and counsels have been given them. What more direct or emphatic word could be uttered than is found in the closing portion of the second psalm? It reads, Be wise now, therefore, O you kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss his son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. Mm -hmm. When his wrath is kindled, but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Falling as it does at the end of the great tribulation, the judgment of the nations concerned that one generation that will have afflicted Israel during the time of Jacob's trouble. But all the present sufferings of Israel at hand of certain Gentile peoples there is still no situation in the world today which would serve as a basis 
upon which the nations might be judged as they will be judged in that coming day in the tribulation period times of Jacob chapter Daniel's 70th week to some these verdicts upon the nations seem extreme especially that pronounced upon those on his left hand it is probable however that their departure to the lake of fire is that which belongs to them because of their lost estate and that the actual casting of them into the lake of fire is deferred until the hour described in Revelation 20 11 to 15 Matthew 13 30 the place to be taken in the kingdom by the sheep nations is prepared and designed for them from the foundation of the world which indicates a definite election under the sovereignty of God what he has determined and declared can never fail I believe that what God has determined can fail even if you fail to claim God is going to find a way to get you to that point where you realize that you need to claim it in conclusion it may be it may be well to restate that this is the Messiah King's farewell message to Israel in its early portions is recorded his own description of the great tribulation his severity is asserted and the, and the reign of the end of the deferred portion of the Jews, Jewish age is disclosed following this is the description of the king's return as set forth by the king himself this he adds long and faithful warnings to that people to the end that they may be prepared for the day when they see all these things beginning to come to pass Israel must be judged on the basis of faithfulness and right conduct and in the matter of watching the nation must be judged also as a vindication of Jehovah's sovereign right and purpose to exalt one elect nation above all the nations of the earth and in the demonstration of his resentment are the sufferings which the nations will have imposed upon that people beloved and cherished of God. This brings us now to an end of the Olivet Discourse. So we have looked so far at two discourses. The one that is Sermon to the Mount, including the Beatitudes, and the Olivet Discourse. So we are going to begin to look now at the upper room discourse. You notice they are very long. Dr. Schaefer, Professor Schaefer of Dallas Theological Seminary is a man who is, you know, full of words and is very analytic. And they had a lot to say. So this is the upper room discourse now. The third and last of Christ's major discourses, and I said the major ones, the three major ones, Sermon on the Mount, Olivet Discourse, Upper Room Discourse. There were other discourses, but they were not major. This is the last of the, of the major discourses. is recorded in John, chapters 13 to 17. And though given to his disciples, as are the other two, this is even more distinctive in character and purpose than the two already considered. This is not for the Jews. The attention, attentive and discerning student will become aware upon the consideration of, the, of this portion. He is confronted at once with that form of doctrine which belongs only to the church in the present age and that it unlike the sermon on the mount or the Olivet discourse which look backward to the Old Testament setting this looks forward into the following portions of the New Testament which was then unwritten 
was written yet. But it, well, it, it, it dealt with what is writ written in the New Testament and would have been written. This address termed a conversation by some is a seed plot of all grace teachings and it is asserted here that in no portion of the scriptures that which may be termed uncomplicated Christian doctrine is more clearly announced. In view of the habit of some theologians calling all biblical doctrine Christian <laughs> and some who claim that every promise in the book is mine every line, every dash, every <laughs> no, it's so wrong. It is pointed out again that in this work on theology, that which is Christian in character is distinguished from Judaism and is confined to God's purpose in the present age, namely, the old calling from both Jews and Gentiles of those who, having been transformed through redeeming grace by the body of the body and bride of Christ. Choose related to the church, this heavenly people is found in the latter portions of the New Testament, are more definitely all that fo follows the synoptic gospels. Since this heavenly company is to be distinguished from all other peoples of the earth by differences which are immeasurable, it is to be expected that there will be a body of revelation specifically addressed to and designed for them. There is such a body of truths and its first pronouncement was made by Christ himself in the upper room. There is such a body of Christ, the body of truths, and its first pronouncement and the first, the, okay, let me say it again, there is such a body of truth for the church. And its first pronouncement was made by Christ himself in the upper room. The upper room discourse is therefore the voice of Christ and is the foundation of that which constitutes the positions, possessions and privileges of Christian. Again, attention is called to the great difference between up, the great difference which obtains between the three major discourses of Christ. So great indeed that they should they would hardly be attributed to the same speaker. But the Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse seems related directly or indirectly to the oncoming messianic kingdom have that much in common. Over against this, it will be seen that there is no bond of truth whatsoever between the two discourses already considered and the upper room discourse. Those two and this one. There's no bonding, there's no relations, relation, relation between them, connection. These far-reaching declarations should be attested by every student and it is confidently believed that to identify the varied character of these discourses is to reach the foundation of a right understanding of the sacred text. Especially is it true that to comprehend the exact teaching of Christ in the upper room is to become aware of that which is purely Christian in its character. Likewise, attention is again called to the transition that evidently took place in the two or three days that intervene, intervened between the giving of the Olivet Discourse, which was addressed to the disciples as representative men of Ju Judaism, and the upper room discourse, which contemplates these same men as no longer in Jewish law, but as clean through the word spoken unto them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and no greater transformation could be indicated than is asserted by Christ when he said to these men, they are not of the world. Cosmos. Even as I am not of the world. John 17, 14 to 16. And these are now sent into the world. Cosmos. 
as the Father sent the Son into the world. They are now vitally related to Christ, as is indicated by the words, You in me and I in you. John 14, 20. They now form a new unity comparable only to that which exists between the Father and the Son. Of this unity, Christ said, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. St. John 17, 21 to 23. So these same men, the entire new body of doctrine was delivered, and that from that time forth they found the relationship in the headship. Of the one who died for them and in whom they were raised to new life, newness of life. This discourse is clearly dated, which reference to its avocation. Mm -hmm. It was to go into effect only after his death. That is that discourse, the upper room discourse. This resurrection is ascension and after the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost or at Pentecost. In other words, these age transforming events are required before this age could be inaugurated. These men must await the working of the plan of God. It was said by Christ to them that they would come into the knowledge of the truth and know their relationship when the Spirit came. No such doctrine had ever been introduced into the world. It is foreign to those scriptures which went before. There are at least seven major main doctrines presented in this discourse. These are not approached in a systematic and orderly teaching. The method is more uh, natural conversation such as Dorothy had characterized his instructions to these men in the preceding three years. The informality of it is demonstrated by the fact that Christ returned to certain subjects several times. He refers to prayer three times, to the Holy Spirit's new ministry in the world at least five times. This discourse has by expositors generally been extended to include the high priestly prayer as recorded in John chapter 17. First 13 of that prayer so it leads to prayer to the discourse. It reads, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might know that my joy fulfilled in them, in themselves. A complete exposition of all that discourse presents cannot be entered into here. As before observed, it embraces the very foundation of all that belongs to Christian life and service, and its fuller consideration must be assigned to all the divisions of their work on the theology. It will also be noted that there is little reference in this portion of Scripture to the way of salvation and the ground upon which it rests. The first twelve chapters of John declare the gospel of divine grace for the unsaved. Beginning with chapter 13, truth is presented with which applies only to those who are saved. Even John 16, 7 through 11, 
though the findings of spirit work for the unsaved is not the message to them, but is a message of a measurable value to the believers in directing his testimony and soul winning activities. The major themes which are included in this course, this course and which are so vital to the Christian life and service, which we are going to be looking at, one one, a, a new relationship to God through Christ. B, cleansing unto unbroken fellowship. C, abiding in Christ for fruit bearing. C, D, a new relationship to the Holy Spirit. E, a new relationship between believers. E. And you groan for prayer. G. New hope. When we come back, we're going to start a new relationship. New relationship. We're going to come back with that. So we have looked at a Jewish uh, position and teachings, our teaching to the Jews, what was meant for the kingdom people. We're going to be looking at what is meant for the bride. Do your reflection and email me. God bless you.